Hello, and welcome to um, Radical Engagements here at Barn Blog. And today we're talking about how Draper, 1967 essay, Who's Going to Be the Lesser Evil in 1968? This is from Heil Draper's Period as an Independent Socialist. Uh, this was first published in the Independent Socialist newspaper in January, February of 1967. It was published again in the New Left of the 1960s, published by Berkeley in 1972. It was reprinted a, a third time in the ISR in 2004, uh, clearly in response to the Bush presidency, and reprinted also in The Socialist Worker um, in 2004 because of the lesser evil is in debate uh, about John Kerry. Um, now, I want to talk about this. There's some things in this that turn out to be wrong. There's some things that this turn out to be right, and it's very short. Um, we can go through it in one sitting for a change. Let's talk about this for a second. In 1960, let's just, uh, let's talk about this for a second. In 1968, Hal Draper um, was involved with the free speech movement. Um, he, I believe at this point, was involved with the independent socialist movement, as I said. Um, he had been involved with the free speech movement at Berkeley as a librarian as early as 1964. Um, and he was seen as a precursor to the new left. Um, he wrote... Uh, uh, account of his engagement with the Berkeley free speech movement in 1965. Um, uh, the Independent Socialist Committee had not yet, however, become the International Socialist uh, group that it would become in 1968. So um, this is before the IS tradition um, really separates itself out. But this is after Draper is really not really associated directly with Max Shackman as Max Shackman has moved uh, for the right, has joined the Socialist Party. Um, the Socialist Party of America, and I think by this point even uh, Shackman... Um, Shackman had that's interesting um Shackman and Draper had started distancing because um uh Draper was angry with Shackman's failure to condemn the Bay of, the Bay of Pigs invasion. Um, and he also had, Shackman had favored a negotiated peace settlement rather than unilateral withdrawal, which uh, Draper also thought was, in, was pretty right wing. Um, so that's just context for what's going on in 1967, um, which is different from the last, uh, time I talked about Shackman, I mean, Dr Shackman and Draper in the um, excavation series with Jordan Dubin when we talked about his 1940s article um, on the inevitability of socialism. But back to this little piece by Draper. In 1968, when the presidential Swedish things comes up again, liberals all over the country are likely to face the California syndrome. At risk of sounding like a California, I am refer a Californian. I am referring to the political pattern that was acted out in the recent Brown Reagan contest in that state, uh, which is with Edmund Pat Brown versus Ronald Reagan, whose citizens have this in common with New Yorkers that they tend to think that whatever is happening in their state is happening is what's happening. Sometimes it is. Let me reread that again, because that's witty and I screwed it up. 
1968, when the presidential sweet states comes again, all liberals of the country will likely face a Californian syndrome, a risk of sounding like a Californian. I'm referring to the political pattern acted out in the recent Brown-Reagan contest in the state, whose citizens have this in common with New Yorkers. They tend to think that whatever is happening in their state, it's what's happening that's capitalized. Sometimes it is. In 1968, the problem is going to be vote for William Johnson again or not. That actually doesn't end up being the problem. <laughs> Uh, the 68 Democratic Convention goes way south because Johnson steps out of the race. But this is still interesting because this is a problem. This is a reason why this was reprinted in 2004 and would probably be reprinted today as a reminder of the situation that you're going into. How many times have you heard this lesson of your argument? Among all those schizophrenic people who whose heart is famous in the right place via little left of center, ulcers are going to ulcerate. Psychiatrists' cows will get political and navels will be contemplated with a glassy stare. Asterisk, does that not sound like what we're going to deal with Biden, where everyone's very angry at Biden and Biden's failures, but they're totally terrified of Trump, so we're going to have to deal with the less evil one more fucking time? We've been dealing with it for over a half century, and things continue to move rightward. Just going to say, come on, people. Johnson or Nixon, Johnson or Romney, that's George Romney, by the way, uh, Mitt Romney's father. Johnson or Reagan, we know who Reagan is, Reagan comes back with a vengeance later, Johnson or anybody. As a matter of fact, even before this point of reach, there are bids fair to be a similar pattern inside the Democratic Party machine itself, Johnson or Kennedy Fulbright or its equivalent. That is... Um, John F. Kennedy and James William Fulbright, which was a hypothetical 1968 ticket. Kennedy served as Attorney General to, I mean, Robert F. Kennedy as Attorney General to his brother John. Brief presidential administration became Senator in 1964. He was assassinated in June 1968, which stopped him from really having a chance. All right. Back to the text. Now that radicals have been want to approach this classic problem with two heady labels, which are as fine as far as they go. One is called the Tweedledeem Tweedledum pattern, and the other called, is called the Lesser Ever pattern. Neither of these necessarily quite describes what's happening, that's in capitals. To see why, let's take a quick look at both of them in terms of 1968. The 68 race could be a Tweedledum Tweedledee affair. And it may be, for example, Johnson versus Governor Romney. One can defy even Max Lerner to insert the, the razor-thin sentence between the politics respectively represented by the two millionaires. In fact, they are bound to be a sector of liberal sentiment that would indeed see lesser evil in Romney, since there is yet no evidence that Romney is quite as rascally a liar as a president leader of the free world. But roughly speaking, these are two politically indistinguishable. This is the defining characteristic of the Tweedledum, Tweedledee pattern, the sociological label thus invented by the professional witch doctors is consensus politics, a.k.a. that's Biden versus Nikki Haley. Cough, cough. Back to this. In contrast, the lesser evil pattern means that there's significant political difference between the two candidates, but, and but to explain the but, let's take for the reasons that will appear, not in the current example, but in the classical example. The day after Reagan's election as governor of California, the liberal pro-Brown acquaintance met me with a haggard face and a fever brow, muttering, quote, didn't they ever hear of Hitler? Didn't they ever hear of Hitler? Did he mean that Reagan was Hitler? Well, he said darkly, look at how Hitler got started. By the way, this is Warren speaking, the comparison of Republicans to fascist has been persistent going all the way back to Nixon and Reagan. A light struck me about what was going on in his head. Look, I said, you've heard of Hitler, so tell me this. 
How did Hitler become Hansler of Germany? My program enthusiast was taken aback. Why? He won some election or other, wasn't it? With the terror and a Reichstag fire and something like that? That was after he had already become Chancellor. How did he become Chancellor of Germany? Don't go look it up. In 1937, presidential election, the Nazis ran Hitler. And the main bourgeois parties ran von Hindenburg, the junker general who represented the right wing of the Weimar Republic, but not the fascism. The Social Democrats, leading a mass workers' movement, had no doubt about what was practical, realist, and hard-headed politics and what was a utopian fantasy. So they supported Heidenberg as the lesser evil. They rejected with scorn the revolutionary proposal to run their own independent candidate against both reactionary alternatives, a line, incidentally, that could also break the rank and file of the followers of the German Communist Party, which was then pursuing a criminal policy of after Hitler we come and social fascists are the main enemy, a.k.a. Uh, third periodism. So lesser evil... Heidenberg won, and Hitler was defeated, whereupon President Heidenberg appointed Hitler to the chancellorship, and the Nazis started taking over. The classic case of the people who voted for level, lesser evil and got both. Now, in 1966, America is not 1932 Germany, to be sure, but the difference speaks the other way. Germany's back was up against the wall. There was an, an insoluble social crisis. It had to go to revolution or fascism. The stakes were extreme. This is exactly why the 1932 is a classic case of the lesser evil, because even though the stakes were high, even when voting for the lesser evil meant a historical disaster, today when the stakes are not so high, the lesser evil policy makes even less sense. But Hal Draper's point still stands about today, huh? Now, he's gotten the candidates for what's going to happen in 68 wrong. Um, Nixon's going to become stronger. We're going to have to wait to see Reagan come come to dominate um, our gold order. Uh, Romney kind of flames out. Um, although Rom George Romney was a moderate Republican, just like, uh, you know, contemporary Romney is today his son. Um Nonetheless, in 1964, you all know, you know, all the people who convinced themselves that Lyndon Johnson was a lesser evil as against Goldwater. I, excuse me, I got that back together. Goldwater, 64, who was going to do horrible things in Vietnam, like defolerating the jungles. Many of them have since realized that the spike boot was on the other foot, and they lacerated themselves when they thought the man they voted for actually carried out Goldwater's policy. In point of fact, it is unfair to Goldwater. He never advocated steep escalation of the war that Johnson put through. And more to the point, he probably would have been incapable of putting putting it through with his little opposition as a man who could simultaneously hypnotize the liberals with great society rhetoric. Does this not sound familiar? In 1964. So who was really the lesser evil in 1964? The point is that the question, the point is that it is a question which is a disaster, not the answer. Its setups were a choice between one capitalist politician and another, and the feat comes in accepting the limitations to this choice. New development. For the moment, so much for the lesser evil pattern. But there's an interesting difference between the classic case Hitler and Heidenberg in 19. 32, and the johnson Goldwater case. There really was significant political difference between Hitler and Heidenberg. The general himself would have never fascized Germany. If he called the Nazis to the chancellorship, it was because he believed the imposition of government responsibility was a way to domesticate the wild-talking Nazis, that the burden of actually having to run the country would turn them would turn the irresponsible extremists into tame politicians, just like all the others. In the pattern usually seen, as in Humbert Humphreys, but Hindenburg himself was not a Hitler, and he was really a lesser evil. What the classic case teaches us is not that the lesser evil is the same as the greater evil. Cough, cough, people who think that that's what we're saying. Cough, cough. 
Just that is just as nonsensical as liberals argue it, but to be rather this, that you can't fight the victory of the rightmost forces by sacrificing your own independent strength to support elements that is just the next step away from them. This is why the popular front in America has been a disaster. That's why I'm talking. The latter pattern is what has been going on in this country for two decades. Every single liber uh, liberal labor left has made noises about its dissatisfaction with, wa with Washington was trickling through. All the Democrats had to do was bring about the boogie of the Republican right. This is in 1967, people. The structure of this argument goes back to at least 1964. And Lyndon Johnson was the most progressive president since FDR, actually, sincerely. How much have I heard that about Biden? Hmm? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Back to the text. This pattern is what's been going on in this country for two decades. Every oh, excuse me. The lib labs would would then swoon, crying, "The fascists are coming!" and vote for the lesser evil. And in the last two decades, the Democrats have learned well that they have the lib lab vote in their back pocket, and therefore the forces to be appeased are those to the right. Asterisk. Still true today. Nothing has changed on this front. Nothing has changed since fucking Truman. In fact, we just keep on viewing the past as better. The forever if onlys. Dude, after Schlesinger talks about Henry Rollins needing to be thrown under the bus, and you have Schlesinger and Reinhold Niebuhr and Sidney Hook and all those people um, turning against their socialist past, um, but thinking they're going to get a lot more out of the Keynesian social compact than they actually end up getting, even in the high point in the late 40s and the 50s. Come now. That's not my point, by the way. Um, I think it's a fair point. I believe that point was made by Tr Tristan Van Pine in an unpublished paper. All right. Um, And we're back to the test. The Lib Labs were very happy enough as Hubert Humphrey showed up at a banquet to make his liberal speeches. Or before that, that the Kennedy myth, which bemused them even while the first leader on the planet poised his finger over the nuclear war burden and said, or else, with the Lib Lab votes in the pocket, politics in this country have moved steadily right, right, right until even Lyndon Johnson could look like a lesser evil. And this is essentially why even when there really is a lesser evil, making the lesser evil choice undercuts any possibility of really fighting the right. The argument is not that they're both the same. The argument is by continuing to play this game, the right always gets the move. Liberals want to make it seem like we don't know that there's a difference between Biden and Trump. But I want to, I want to point out, there's a difference between Biden and Trump, but Biden still normalized, even though we condemn Trump, we normalized, what, 80% of Trump's policies? What do you think will happen if Trump wins and the next Democrat comes? What do we normalize after that? Because that's been the pattern now for not just my lifetime, for my parents' lifetime. And I am over 40. I have been making this argument before I even knew about Hal Draper and his existence even before I was even a left winger for all my adult life.
even if you don't think it's easy to change this or it's impossible to be changed after all the reforms that have gone through since the 1990s after Ross Perot happened to make sure that this doesn't happen easily in the United States, continuing to pretend that you're going to break a pattern by essentially doing the same pattern over and 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 over again, all the way back to when, I mean, really, I've talked about this going all the way back to um, the liquidation of the populist party when they picked a Democrat as their national candidate in the, in the character of William Jennings Bryant in 1890-something, or 1904. You got over a century and a generation of this not working, and yet you refuse to admit that it doesn't work. And it's not because we don't, that we think Trump and Biden are the same. It's because this structural capacity as set up means that the only way things can move is appeasing the right to try to stop the more right. And you often don't win because the more right looks more dynamic. Come now. Back to the text. But now notice this pattern. When the lesser evil named Johnson was elected in 1964, he did not call in the greater evil to power, as did Hindenburg. He did not merely act so in so flabby a manner that the right-wing alternative was thereby strengthened. Another classic pattern. These patterns would have been old stuff, the historical lesser evil pattern in full form. What is belittling about Johnson was that the lesser evil turned out to be the greater evil, if not worse. Was it then a tweedled, dumb Tweedledee pattern after all? Or am I merely saying that the apparent difference between Johnson and Goldwater, even within the framework of capitalist politics, was just an illusion? Is this conclusion merely that all capitalist politicians have to be the same, and therefore the case of voting against the lesser evil is that there is no lesser evil? I don't think that's the answer. I think there's a third pattern around, which is neither Tweedledum and Tweedledee nor Tweedledum, nor the classic lesser evil choice. If the Johnson Goldwater contest is one example, then there is even better one provided by the recent Brown Reagan race. For Pat Brown really is a liberal, whatever you may think of Johnson, and thereby hangs the tail. Because this genuine liberal, Pat Brown, acted for eight years as governor of California in no important respect differently from the conservative Republican would have done, the operative word is acted. He sold the water program to big landholding companies, as his two Republican predecessors never dared to do. He fought tooth and nail for the Bryce Rose system, as no Republican governor of the agricultural state dared to do. It was he, not Clark Kerr, who in 1964 unleashed an army of police against Berkeley students. After the Rots uprising, it was he who named John McCone, C. McCone commissioner to whitewash the whole business, and who was in support of, by the right wing's anti-riot law, to intimidate the ghetto. It was Brown who gave liberal Democrat CDC the final decapitation when he personally mobilized all his strengths to oust Cy Cassidy as a CDC head. If half of this had been done by Reagan, the Lib Labs would be yelling fascism all over the place, as they will be no doubt doing the next four years. Asterisk. The problem that you have as Hal Draper is pointing out in 1967, is that liberal politicians can do the same thing as the right, even if they believe differently, because they will get less opposition. And when the Republicans see that, they're going to push it further and get more opposition, probably achieve less, but have far greater and more dangerous rhetoric, thus normalizing the move to the right even further. This is not a pattern that began with Clinton. This is not a pattern that even began with Johnson. This is a pattern that began at the beginning of the 20th century. If you think it's still practical to ignore that, I don't know what to do with you.
And I repeat that I don't think this took place simply because Pratt bound with a Tweedledee reflecting the image of Bregan. Here's a somewhat different interpretation. A profound change has taken place in this country since the days of the New Deal and has taken place in the nature of capitalist politics, and therefore in the two historic wings of capitalist politics, liberalism and conservatism. In the 1930s, there was a general indifference in the programs put before capitalism by its liberal and conservative wings. The New Deal liberals proposed to save capitalism at a time of deep growing crisis and despair by stratification, that is, by increasing state intervention into the control of the economy from above. It is notorious that some of the most powerful sectors of the very class that was beginning to be saved hated Roosevelt like poison. This added to the illusions of the Roosevelt Revolution at the time, of course. Roosevelt himself always insisted that the turn towards state capitalist intervention was necessary to save capitalism itself, and he was right. In fact, the New Deal conquered not only the Democratic, but the Republican Party. When Roosevelt's New Deal and Truman's Fairdale were succeeded by Eisenhower's regime, the free enterprise founding Republicans continued and even intensified the exact same social course that Roosevelt had begun. This reality behind the whole birthright charge that Eisenhower is a card-carrying communist. Excuse me. Yeah. In three and a half decades since 1932 and before, during and after the Second World War, which intensified the process, the capitalist system ha has itself been going through a deep-going process of bureaucratic stratification. The underlying drives are beyond the scope of this article, but the fact itself is plain to see. The liberals who sparked this transformation were once imbued with the illusion that they were undermining the, the going system. Any child can now see that they knew that, that they knew not what they did. The conservatives who denounced all steps in this transformation and who had to be dragged kicking and screaming into the new stage, were also imbued with the very same illusion. But even Eisenhower, who has never been accused of being an egghead, and who, before he was nominated for presidency, made the exact same sort of free enterprise hurrah speech as Reagan was paid to for General Electric, even he was forced to act in the highest office no differently from a New Deal Democrat, because that is the way the system can now operate. Asterisk. I'm going to add to that, New liberalism, which Reagan intensified, celebrated, made more brutal, was begun by Jimmy Carter. This is far talking, but it needs to be noted. The fruits of lesser evilism. Under the present bureaucratic stratified capitalism, liberalism and conservatism converge. This does not mean that they are identical, or even becoming identical. They are merely increasingly tend to act in the same way in essential respects, where the fundamental needs of the system are concerned. See also the fact that there is a continuity between Trump and Biden during COVID, even though Trump couldn't own it and Biden could. As per Robert Brenner and his uh, seven theses on Biden, a uh, piece that I don't agree with, except for that statement, which is fundamentally true. Just as when Trump vetoed Taft Hartley and then voted it against the striking workers, what is more, because liberal politicians can point a, war uh, a warning finger towards the right, and because Lib Labs will always respond to it, Lib Labs is like what we say Rad Libs now. Uh, will always respond to it. They are even more successful than conservatives in carrying out those measures which conservatives advocate. Asterisk. Barn talking. When you read the shock doctrine, which Naomi Klein tries to make about Milton Friedman, she actually spells out that the deepest neoliberalism didn't happen by Pinochet, but by the liberal successors of Pinochet in Chile. That it was actually Sweden's socialist government was able to deeply neoliberalize faster because they had more control over government apparatuses in regards to the state. And that it was often seemingly center-left politicians who got further in neoliberalizing then center right one to see Clinton as opposed to Reagan. Is it clear to you yet the pattern? Because if it's not, I don't know how much more fucking history I can throw at you. If you don't see this from an article written literally almost 60 years ago, of whom almost everyone mentioned in it is now dead. And yet the pattern is the same. And you guys think it just goes back to the 1990s? And you think you're just going to change it? 
wake up. It is hard to resist the moment. I admit that. And this is why progressives become so unpopular. Because it, it's become very clear that they're not really going to do shit even when they win. And that's not a new pattern. That's not just the squad or Rashida Tlaib. I have friends who think that this is a new thing caused by the PMC. No, my friends, this is a long-established trend. Now, the quote PMC, if you want to call it a class, is part of it. This stratification goes back to the 1940s, but it goes before then, too. Back to the text. Just as when Truman voted Taff Hartley, excuse me, just as when Truman vetoed Taff Hartley and then invoked it against striking workers. Yeah, I've had people defend Truman and then admit that he used Taff Hartley. Uh, what is more, because liberal politicians can point a, war a warning figure at the right, and because lib labs will always respond to it, that you've been more successful than conservatives at carrying out those measures which conservatives advocate. It is not necessary to claim that even a pitiful man, Herbert Humphrey, is merely a hypocrite. No, I fully believe myself that he is a sincere liberal as the next lib lab specimen. It is liberalism that requires the examination, not Humphrey's morals. Nor is it even more pathetic man, Adelaide Stevenson, simply a rascal who found themselves lying like a trooper at the UN in the sight and knowledge of the whole world. Adelaide Stevens, precursor to Powell. So between the Tweedledee and Tweedledums and the lesser evils, who's really different in the policy from the greater evils, we increasingly are getting this third type of case. The lesser evils who, as executors of the system, find themselves acting in every important juncture exactly like the greater evils, and sometimes worse. See Clinton doing far more welfare reform than Reagan could. Back to the pit, back to the piece. They are products of an increasing convergence of liberalism, conservatism under the conditions of bureaucratic capitalism. AKA Robert Brenner's quote, political capitalism is not new. It goes back to Fordism. It goes back to most of the 20th century. It, the difference is, as Brenner points out, is that there's less profits to go around, although there's still some. Uh, us in China have essentially the same GDP growth right now, which is crazy. There was never an error when the policy of the lesser even made less sense than now. Oh, there, but there's an error in the future coming, Draper. <laughs> it's right now, in 2023. The thing to remember for 2028, I mean, for 1968 as a starter. I hope you guys get it. I hope you do. It's not about, you know, the inner heart of Joe Biden. It's not about simple moral corruption like that. It's about a structure. All right. And this is what distinguishes some of us from people who, from the populace who thinks we can just, you know, stand up to a few bureaucratic elite and pass some reforms and get this done. It ain't gonna work like that, my friends. It's time you realized it. This has gone on for a long, long time. And it's the same generation. Another generation of 20 year olds is gonna waste their fucking lives doing this shit. Like and subscribe. Share, please. Have a good day.